Hello, my name is Johanna. Normally I say that I make videos to avoid writing, but I've actually done those 60 pages. So now I just do videos to avoid editing my writing. Today's video is another science video. Don't worry, I haven't stopped doing gaming. I still do gaming videos. I'm just doing a bit of a, a science thing right now, okay? And this video is actually not really a YouTube video. It's a recording of a presentation I did on my thesis. So if you're interested in reading research or if you're interested in very specific aphantasia, hyperphantasia, uh, visualization research, this is the video for you. If you're not super nerdy or if you're not like really into this subject, um, I would very much suggest that you watch my other video. I'll put it up here. Um, please go watch my video on measuring aphantasia and hyperphantasia if you're just a little curious. Um, this is a video for the nerds, okay? <laughs> now, while the presentation is actual science me, it's also worth noting that it is an extremely qualitative study. Um, there are so many biases that I don't actually discuss because I had very limited time. Um, so all you academics, uh, don't judge me. I am very, very, very aware of these things. I have 60 pages of awareness on these things. As you can hear, I'm a bit sensitive about my work. Okay, don't, you know, don't add me. Don't come for me. I think it's cool. I think it's fun. Okay, I'll stop talking. I hope you enjoy this presentation. I know I got some really nice feedback, which is also why I'm sharing it, because I am actually very proud of my work so far, this little snippet that you get to see, and also the grander scheme of things where that I'm doing, and I'm just really excited, okay? Enjoy, thank you so much. For, for watching. As Sarah said, this is a presentation on uh, individual degrees of visualization and how it affects the reading experience. And I think very interestingly that um, from the previous presentation, I saw many things that I found very relevant for this. So although I am sort of interrupting an interesting discussion, it's not completely off. <laughs> um, so I'll be taking you through a bit of background, of course, my methodology, and then what are the implications of the cognitive differences on the reading experience. Um, and I'll be briefly uh, brushing over the future of this project because it is a work in progress and I'm, I'm still actively working on this. Um, some background knowledge. We've heard this term imagery a lot of times. Um, but I want to make very clear how I use it and how that may differ from other uses. So imagery in itself, uh, in my case, is a sort of very broad umbrella term for near sensory phenomena. Um, and what I will be uh, dealing with very specifically is object imagery, also known as visual imagery, or what I call visualization. Um, so this is specifically the sort of eyesight of the mind. It's the seeing of uh, like seeing an apple in your mind. It's shape, form, size, um, not to be confused with spatial imagery, which is, which is um, spatiality direction um, of the mind. So when I say visualization, visualization, I'm referring to a specific subtype of imagery and then some other terms that are uh, very important for you to know um, are aphantasia and hyperphantasia. So in the co context of visualization, aphantasia is uh, the inability to see uh, images at all in your mind. Um, so we could call this a blind mind's eye. And then on the other end of this spectrum, we have hyperphantasia, which is an abundance of images, or uh, some definitions simply say um, 
uh, images that are as clear as the, the natural eyesight or even clearer. Um, but it is uh, a very complex spectrum and it's not as simple as uh, very visual and very little visual because it's, it's different for every single individual how they experience uh, visualization. And it's also interwoven with, with different categories, uh, differences in vividness, differences in color representation, uh, field of view, and whether you can project onto the real world as well, and even more categories exist. Um, so it's a very complex spectrum. Um, and also uh, the, the tools that are available to me uh, are all uh, self-report data, which of course also plays a big role um, when measuring visualization. Um, and I'm interested in visualization in the context of reading, um, which uh, I've been very inspired by uh, Aneska Kuzmikova's dissertation. So it's, it's quite an honor that she was here yesterday and did a wonderful talk. Um, but I have quite a different angle that um, as far as I've been able to tell has not been done before, um, where uh, Kuzmikova's dissertation looked at how texts elicit uh, imagery. I'm interested in how readers experience imagery in different ways. Um, the only thing I found that was sort of in the same vein was uh, Lydian Rösing, who briefly mentions um, the idea that there are two types of readers, visual readers and auditory readers. Sadly, she does not explain this further. Um, and it's, I think, very reductive to say that there are only two types of readers. Um, but that's something that may come out in the future that is sort of of the same vein. Um, and then Matthew Makisek uh, did a project on artists, visual artists with aphantasia and how their artistic practice differs, um, which is, of course, dealing with art instead of reading. Um, so how did I actually examine reading uh, and visualization. Um, I've used video ethnography for my data collection. So I have a mix of um, video observation data of uh, reading and a collaborative data collection of experience. So the, the readers were part of deciding how uh, they would data collect. So I have a mix between um, during reading uh, notes in the text, outside the text, verbal notes, uh, and then after the reading period, also written and verbal notes. Uh, and then um, a series of reflexive interviews in order to uh, reach a common uh, definition of uh, their experience or a common understanding of their experience. Um, so basically, I'm interested in how do these people experience reading in different ways. Um, and what do they experience when reading? And uh, very focused on not the interpretations of their reading, not how they interpret the text, but what they actually experience when reading. Uh, really quickly, my respondents are super similar. I have two respondents, uh, both female, almost the same age. They're from the same, da same Danish city. Uh, one has a bachelor's in design and one has a bachelor's in pedagogy and they're both working with creativity and people in their everyday life. Um, and in regards to reading, their sort of reading background is also very similar. Um, both have never worked with literature on a professional level. Uh, both prefer novels and uh, their preferred genre is fantasy. And I asked them to um, think about some claims on literature um, and they literally answered yes and no to the exact same claims. So on a sort of background level, they're very similar. Um, however, they differ in a, in a grand way. Uh, respondent one has aphantasia um, and respondent two has hyperphantasia. 
um, she, uh, Rastani too, also has synesthesia, but I haven't uh, followed this up with further, um, further examination. Um, but I did use uh, the VVIQ that I brushed over earlier uh, for testing, and uh, that seems to uh, confirm that they do have uh, aphantasia and hyperphantasia, respectively. And then for a collection of literature, I uh, chose four texts in their native language, Danish. Um, and I tried to get texts that were as different as possible. They were different in genre, in length. And then I used uh, Kuzmikova's framework as uh, an inspiration um, for choosing texts that would elicit hopefully different imagery types in order to get a very round, uh, round sense of their, their reading experience. Um, my results, so I'll just get some water. So my results, um, first, I would like to talk about respondent two, uh, the person who has hyperphantasia. Uh, to her, images are central to reading. Uh, she has this nice quote. She says, because my visual ability is so developed, I don't really need those other things. Um, and those other things are other imagery types. Um, so when, she, when a text elicits coherent images and that she can almost play it out like a film, this is relaxing to her and we, she really enjoys those types of reading experiences. Whereas if a text, for example, a poem would often elicit fragmented images, this is frustrating to her. Or if she doesn't have images at all from the text, she will be bored. Um, and in addition to boredom, lack of images also um, leads to her seeking out images. She will sort of apply images to the text because she feels like they're lacking and she will be annoyed because these images aren't the right images in her own words. Um, for example, uh, when reading uh, Apocalypse, Apocalypse, she would see zombies, even though uh, zombies weren't uh, actually in the text and she would be very annoyed that the text didn't give her images so she would have to apply her own. Um, and she says that uh, when she is not given images, she feels cheated because she likes images. So she feels they're not giving her what she expects. So that's really central to her reading experience. And she cares greatly about immersion. And to her, immersion is uh, uh, created when experiences flu uh, experiencing fluent images. Um, when asked about feelings and sound, she says they're sort of irrelevant to her secondary. Respondent one, on the other hand, her central experience when reading is sound. Um, so sound is very central to how she experiences reading. Um, that's through narration, uh, her own voice and other voices as well. Uh, it's also through a great emphasis on rhythm and pauses. Um, and then she experiences soundscapes. She gives the example of um, in Harry Potter, uh, she talks about Hagrid's hut and how she can very specifically feel the room and hear um, the, the crackling fire as a soundscape. Um, but a big difference is she does not seek out sound. She doesn't ever feel that sound is lacking because every word is a sound to her. So it's not really something she uh, remembers after reading. It's not something she seeks out. It's simply her method for reading or a tool. What she seeks out, on the other hand, um, is world and emotion. And before I talk more about world and emotion, I just read, want to read a little quote. Uh, she says, what I can't do with images, I can do with sounds instead. So world and emotion. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, both respondents care deeply about uh, immersion. And when they are not immersed, they feel bored and frustrated. Uh, and to respondent two, uh, immersion is fluent imagery, fluid images. <laughs> um, Respondent one feels immersed when there is a world she can step into. 
um, it doesn't have to be familiar, it can be fantasy, but she needs to feel that she's inside the world in her own words. Um, and in addition to a world that she's inside, she needs an emotional impact. Um, and that's something she seeks out. If she doesn't uh, have an emotion when reading, that's something, something she feels is actively lacking. Um, so she has a hard time relating to nonfiction or fiction that doesn't have character vocalization. Um, yeah. And before I move on to my conclusions, I would like to just uh, briefly mention movement and spatiality and how the two respondents uh, experience this differently. Um, uh, yeah, so respondent one who has aphantasia um, obviously doesn't have object imagery, but she has a very developed sense of spatial imagery. She talks about when she tries to force herself to see images uh, in the uh, context, she talks about trying to imagine an apple. Uh, we saw yesterday, you could also try and imagine a lemon. Um, she sort of feels a sparkler effect. She can outline the apple in, in order to try and force the image to be there, but it disappears like a sparkler. The glow is sort of disappearing. Um, and that seems to suggest that she can sort of use her spatial imagery to, to create the shape of an apple, but she cannot see it. Um, she also experiences uh, sort of bodily or cognitive pointing, which is my own term. I haven't found it anywhere, but she can sort of direct in her mind, create direction or, or point without moving her body. She just says, well, I just sort of point with my body. But when asked about her body, she says the body is, is not moving it's a sort of spatiality or pointing in her body or in her cognition. Um, and additionally, her, her reading is very tied up into uh, spatiality. I mentioned this idea of stepping into the world and being in the world or being closed off to the world. Um, and also in, this, in the case with Hagrid Hutt, uh, she has a sense of space. She says that there is clearly the feeling of room and the feeling of spatiality. Respondent two, on the other hand, who has very developed object imagery, does not seem to have that well uh, uh, developed spatial imagery, although she does have it. It seems to only exist um, as part of her images. So she, in her images, she can sort of move around like a camera, uh, create focalization. Um, she can also uh, see images in motion, like a horse galloping, um, but she cannot really understand talking about spatiality outside of images or disconnected from images. Uh, when asked about bodily pointing, she she only talks about having a lot of uh, a lot of uh, arm movement in the in with her actual body, um, and cannot really seem to to disconnect this concept from. Uh, images other than sort of imagining an arrow pointing. Um, so uh, to re re reiterate, um, this shows that, uh, well, firstly, we can see that the reading experience of the two respondents are very different. Um, where respondent two cares deeply about visualization and not really about anything else. Respondent one experiences a sort of mix of imagery types, but not visualization at all. Um, and they both put great emphasis on immersion, but they have very different definitions of immersion and very different ways of reaching immersion. And if we take a sort of step back, this shows us that cognitive differences um, impact how we meet a text and what sort of relationship we have with a text. Um, so uh, I suggest that when understanding reading, we also need to look beyond the text and we need to be very interested in the reader as well. And I think I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> so I will briefly mention that um, in the future, I would like to take this project into uh, the realm of education. Um, there are some things that seem to suggest that maybe we're not aware of uh, Fantasia in education. Uh, Adam Seyman et al, who uh, coined the phrases aphantasia and hyperfantasia, uh, have done a great, uh, a big questionnaire. Um, 
that suggested that people with aphantasia are not uh, likely to be in creative fields. Um, and um, my, uh, the respondent with aphantasia also mentioned creative tasks at, as sort of not very open to people with aphantasia, even though she does work in uh, the creative field of design. Um, so I would love to look at um, the implications of Fantasia um, and how it, uh, it affects uh, learning to read, learning to write, and approaching creativity in school. Um, so that's what I had. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking very much forward to hearing what you guys think. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope someone got something out of that. Again, I cannot stress enough how much this video is not made for YouTube and that I have another video that is made for YouTube uh, that you might enjoy more if you thought well, this was a little bit too much. But no, seriously, like, thank you for watching. Um, I guess I should be writing instead of doing all this multi multimedia stuff. I don't know, man. It's fun, right? It's fun. Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much and like have a really nice day. See you in the next video. Science or gaming. We'll see. Bye.